I got tough competition. Can you all hear me? Is this working here? I guess that's pretty tough competition here on campus. So. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. It's good to see everybody. Uh, it's good to be out in the Midwest. Uh, every, I grew up in the Midwest. I was born uh, in North Dakota. I was raised in North Dakota. So, um, you know, when I was asked to come and speak, I was, I kind of chuckled to myself saying, yes, I, I would love to come out. And I think, uh, I think Antonio was a little surprised. And, and um, I enjoy always coming out here. Uh, I think Midwest people are the best. Everywhere I go, I think that um, um, you can always see that uh, we're always forgiven and, and we're always ready to help people out. So, um, I brought photographs. I, I kind of put them together where I could probably start from the er my earlier works to my later works and what I'm working <coughs> on now. So, uh, the, is the lights dim? Any, Antonio, do you think? So, we can get started here. Um, I'm from the, the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota. I was uh, born there on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. I'm of Mandan Hidatsa uh, descent. I'm a, a Mandan Hidatsa Indian. Uh, the Mandans were the ones that took care of Lewis and Clark in, what, 1804, 1805, 18, in the winter, the tough winter. In fact, it's, it's, I think the bicentennial is happening this year. Am I right? Yeah, the bicentennial is happening. And um, we lived in earth lodges. Uh, uh, soon after they had left, Bodmer came up uh, after they did. Uh, um, George Catlin came up and painted us, and, and Bodmer painted us. So uh, We got wiped out by smallpox. And in the 1830s, uh, smallpox wiped us out. Uh, we were given... Uh, uh, supposedly, a guy came up the Missouri River, and he had the smallpox, uh, and it wiped out our tribe. Some say 63 lived, and some say less than that, but that's, out of that, uh, that's where Zig came from. They integrated us with the Hidatsas, which was a neighboring tribe, a fellow tribe, and they also got wiped out, but not as much. And uh, the Arikara Indians were up that way, so they put us all together. And that's who forms the, um, the um, Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. It's called the uh, Three Affiliated Tribes. Um, we live up there in northwest North Dakota. Um, it, is, it, it is a very desolate country. Uh, being uh, raised there, I remember as a child and being talked in classes about... Um, you know, asking my father uh, simple questions like, where does the telephone pole come from? And I had no concept of trees. It was so barren. And we did have our cottonwoods down on the river bottom. But it was always hard to imagine that uh, where the trees came from. It wasn't until years later when I was traveling, I was going up into um, uh, Alaska. I was going up to... Uh, Photograph. I was photographing up in Seattle, and I caught a ferry up into Alaska that I finally realized where the trees had come from, the telephone poles. Uh, being said that if you could get on a mountain and see for 550, or if you could see for 150 miles, you know, for a child growing up in North Dakota, or even out here in the plains, it was hard to, you know, see until I went into New Mexico and got up on Mount... Uh, on the uh, mountains and finally started to see where the, um, you know, where that came from. I think you're, um, you're, you're, so. Let's get a good touch. There we go. Um, my earlier works, uh, I would usually just set the camera up and uh, take photographs. Uh, here we have a, photograph of uh, me and my brother and my mother and my older brother. Uh, I said I wanted to take a photograph and uh, and um, she said, uh, well wait, let's you know dig in the trunks and bring out the blankets and you know how ironic can that be? Uh, you, on the left you got a Pendleton blanket and he's holding a star, a star quilt and she's holding a Hudson, Bla uh, Hudson Bay blanket. And in the trunks, 
you know, the blankets that wiped us out were uh, contaminated with smallpox. So, and, and she still clung, and many of the tribal people still cling to the power of the blanket and how much you have. Also in the trunks were these two war bonnets. And uh, she, uh, we put them on, and it was, always, it was always a prestigious thing to have these on. Veterans wore them a lot. Uh, my dad had the Native American medicine to uh, make them. Not everybody could make them. You had to have that certain medicine, and that was always passed on. Uh, my father's now passed on, and my brothers have that medicine. We were, we were a big family, and um, we were put into the... Uh, the uh, boarding school systems. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The earlier works, um, these old photographs were found in the attic. And uh, I would take them and uh, go ahead and, and claim the, enlarge, uh, the gang darkroom and, and claim all the enlargers. And find the um, developmental time for that top image and the side image and the children image and go ahead and start printing on, on large paper, 20 by 24 paper. This is before the computer. I just wanted to show that huge transition from uh, traditional life to where I'm at, where I was at now. So, and that being the home. So, uh, earlier works, um, I was studying at the University of New Mexico I grew up uh, in North Dakota and was put in a boarding school system in uh, South Dakota and um, went on to do my high school in Utah. And uh, when I was in um, South Dakota, I was put into a boarding school system with a lot of uh, South Dakota Indians, Cheyenne, Sioux, uh, a lot of Winnebago's from Nebraska. Um, and you know, you, your, your buddies were your, you, these Sioux Indians and uh, Winnebago's and so forth. And I started to listen to the stories they told. And, and when I went on to high school, I went on to Intermountain Indian School in Brigham City, Utah. And that's when I went to school with the Utes and the Mountain Utes and the Southern Utes, uh, the Blackfeet, the Crow, you know, the um, Shoshones, the Shoshone Bannocks, the Arapahoe. So I, there was a, quite a number of uh, tribal groups going to school. That was a government school. And I would listen to these stories, and I would compare them to the stories that I was raised on, and uh, I, I started to study more. I wanted to go on to uh, study more Native Americans, and I went on to the University of uh, Northeastern Oklahoma State University in Oklahoma, and that's when I started to study the Oklahoma Indians. You had your Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, Seminoles, Cherokees, your five civilized your Comanches, your Kiowas, your Osages, your Otos, you know, your Pawnees and Poncas and Osages and so forth. And uh, I would study them and, um, and uh, get to know their stories. Let me see if I can focus that. So, uh, some of the stories, uh, one we had was Mahubawea. And uh, that was a story my mother would always say, you know, if you're not good, Mahuba is going to come and get you and take you. My dad would always say, well, you know, if you see the guy on the street not doing well and he's lying on the street, he's uh, his, uh, out of balance. Mahuba will has him. And, uh, but that's okay. He's going to get better. And, uh, you know... It, it, she was a beautiful woman who lived in the trees. I think when you guys go hiking and go up into the Rockies, you'll always come across these ravens, and they'll be there, and they'll hackle you and laugh at you. But that's what Mahabawea came from. So I did this series of Mahabawea here. Uh, this one image, that, that image actually... Um, I did this image. I was really short on cash at the University of New Mexico. I took out this poster, and uh, Betty Hahn was teaching me the non-silver techniques of uh, gum bichromate, uh, cyanotypes to blue printing, and this here is a Van Dyke. I was a potter before I was a photographer, and I would make these masks and re-photograph them and go ahead and high-fire them, raccoon-fire them. And at the same time, I was coming up into the uh, ruins of the southwest, and these are the Anasazi ruins. 
and I would go ahead and incorporate them into my art. Just showing that huge traditional sacredness of these ruins. And I tell people that when uh, I tell my classes, when you go into areas like this, have respect for them. When you go into a church, you have respect. Uh, places of uh, you know worship is always a good thing to have that type of respect. Uh, I put it into a show at uh, the University of New Mexico, and um, and uh, it sold. So I can't, I didn't go to the show actually, but I was a little undergraduate, and I went, and the guy was so ecstatic. He said, "Zig, your your work sold," and I said, "Great, where's the money?" and uh, <laughs> And he said, uh, don't you, you want to know who bought it? And I said, who? And he said, the, uh, con the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. So that started it all, I think. Uh, Machaba Wea, very beautiful. Uh, she's got a voice. She can sing and lure you in and then take your soul and break you. But then again, you do learn, you relearn. Uh, earlier works, uh, uh, getting more political. Um, we grew up. We grew up on this food out in the, up in North Dakota. Uh, it was Commodity Day. Um, you know, um, Commodity Day was the first Thursday of every month. I remember my father saying, "Get zig up, let's go get our commodities." And I was the biggest in the family, and uh, I would get up and we'd go down and wait in line with the other Indians. And these were food stored in the Midwest in case of nuclear attack from Russia. I think when you go out into uh, North Dakota, well, probably even in some of the other plain states, you'll see all these missile bases. And um, well, what are you going to do with that food? Uh, there's no attack happening. Well, we're going to just go, why don't we just give it to the Indians? So this is the food we grew up with. And uh, we had chicken, pork, luncheon meat. Uh, my brother and his uh, family there and an old Albert Beersted painting. I would go ahead and re-photograph that, uh, print it out in matte paper, hand color it, uh, print out my brother, cut him out and, and, and uh, put him out there and re-photograph the government foods and then go ahead and re-photograph it and reprint it. So. Just showing that huge transition from traditional life to what we were, what we were having now. Uh, some of the foods, uh, sodium ethyrobate, you know, sodium nitrate, you know, the life expectancy of Native Americans is like, you know, early 70s, you know, maybe early 80s, maybe about. Sometimes you get us living more and uh, we got high blood pressure, we're, we're dying off very quickly. Um, my dad used to be able to go ahead and cook the chopped meat 10 different ways. And what was chopped meat? It was, it was like a spam. And you just cooked it up. So I wonder if any Indian women knew what, sodium, what these ingredients were. You know. In a way, it was, you know, they're still being served up there. But what, do you, what, what, can you, when you, what can you get when you don't have anything? So. Uh, an earlier piece, uh, again, using an old photograph found in the attic showing that huge transitional uh, phase. Uh, this image here is of uh, my grandfather, my dad's father, and his name was Dancing Bull. Um, that's what was on our certificates and, and our, our birth certificates. But uh, the government came in and said, no, you can't have those kind of names. Uh, on, on the left, the guy standing is... Uh, 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 bird beaks, and uh, the government gave him the name Stevenson and gave my grandfather Jackson, so that's why I get Jackson from. Uh, the image on the left is uh, of the uh, religions that came into our culture, and, and uh, you know, it was a divide and conquer type technique to teach us uh, the way of the, uh, the um, religions. My brother's behind her. Actually, uh, Brother Paul was very good to us. Uh, Brother Bonaventure down here taught us all how to paint and draw. So and it was a school where I remember uh, leaving uh, in the, when I was in the third grade, I started. And we were kept there in South Dakota all year. Uh, my older brother had it worse, though. They took him when he was a little first grader. And uh, 
and most of the tribal people up there were raised that way. I don't think they do that no more. Um, they do, the school uh, still does exist and uh, it's gotten much linear. Uh, I don't think they uh, had practice of what they used to when we were younger. Uh, another earlier photograph, I remember trying to sell my works in galleries and photo, photo galleries in the Southwest and they wouldn't take anything but turn of the century photographs, toned images. So I would selectively tone my images and I said, you want toned Indians, I'll give you toned Indians. So this is, this is my niece, and I would use a photo mascoid, uh, kind of like a rubber cement. I would go ahead and color, uh, use that on, the, uh, brush it on the outside, except for her, and then dip it into some copper toner, and then rub the rubber cement off, and um, do the, the toned Native American. Of course, no one bought them, but you know. <laughs> It was survival. Another earlier photograph, I started to know more about the Native Americans coming down to Oklahoma, finding out their style of dress, know what you photograph, know your tribal you know, cultures. Uh, the guy on the left is uh, um, a Hidatsa grass dancer, and the guy in the middle is a Sacken Fox from Oklahoma. He's a Southern Plains. And the guy on the right is a Comanche guy from uh, New Mexico. Uh, the bear shield he had, uh, it was hit in the, um, on the road in Tijeras Canyon in um, Albuquerque, and uh, it was on the radio. It was a really dry time, and the bears were coming down into the city, and a car hit it, and uh, he went up to the park service, and uh, we quested it, and they gave it to him. In fact, that's where we get all our feathers if uh, an eagle is killed, we go to the park service and they're, they're saved for Native Americans. And they give them to the Native Americans, so. Um, every summer, as long as I could remember, um, I went to school in Oklahoma uh, in Tahlequah and got my undergraduate degree at Northeastern. Uh, I went on to the University of New Mexico to work on a master's and that's where I picked up photography. I studied there with some great people, uh, uh, Tom Barrow for one, uh, Patrick Nagatani, a few photographers in here know these people, uh, Betty Hahn, uh, Rod Lazoric, and went on to study with um, Merido Rubenstein, went on to the San Francisco Art Institute to get my master's and studied with Linda Connor and Jack Fulton and Rod, um, uh, Reagan Louie and, um, you know, but uh, every summer I would uh, pack my car up and leave uh, the city and go and photograph. And I would travel and sleep in the back of my um, van or my car at that time. And sometimes I, I did have a pickup. And uh, this one area I would go to would be up in uh, southeast Montana. And this is a guy I met up there and his name was Austin Two Moons. And at the time, I was getting uh, kind of political with my photographs. I was always getting into like um, finding out a lot about photographers that photographed Native Americans. One was Edward S. Curtis. And he would photograph the Native American, but he would always make them look stoic. Don't laugh, don't do anything, I want to take this photograph. And in ways that stereotyped us, Hollywood would pick it up. Hollywood would make us act like, you know, make sure you talk like this, you know. And Native Americans are great. We, we love to joke, we love to laugh, and we love to tease. Um, this little series was a, a piece I, I, I photographed Austin in his little, little house in Busby, Montana. His great-grandfather was in the Battle of Little Bighorn, his great-great-great, two greats. And, um, you know, not very far from where he was at, uh, they did the last Sundance and before they went over the hill into the, uh, um, the um, Little Bighorn River area and camped out before Custer came over a couple days later. So uh, here he is. I, I, was, uh, I tell people that um, one time I was uh, having a show at the, uh, in San Francisco <laughs> and I saw uh, I was going to put the stoic uh, Austin in there. I said, if I can tone this image, and uh, put it into the show, I'm sure it'll sell and I can pay my rent. <clears throat> then I looked at the um, contact sheet and I saw this image. 
I said, what a beautiful smile. And I put this one in, and, and of course it never sold, but it's still I stuck to my concept. So it kind of went on into Stoic Indians. Don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh. Okay, now you can laugh. So I would go ahead and, and do the, the, the be stoic and then, okay, laugh. So that kind of went into that series. Uh, the lady on the right is my mother. Uh, we're matrilineal. All of the Plains Indians are matrilineal. Everything comes from the woman. Uh, if you're married into a certain tribe, you're going to be of that woman's um, clan. Um, uh, the medicines are given, uh, the women give us the medicines. Uh, you treat your woman bad, uh, you treat your future bad. Uh, you, the, lady in the, the lady in the middle, that is uh, my cousin Joyce. She was a, um, lived in Claremore, Oklahoma, actually. Uh, she was the uh, first outspoken lesbian of the tribe. She would, she, would, she would dance in men's dances and dress as a man and dance and win. And the men couldn't say anything. If they, com <laughs> if they complained, it showed them how little they were. So uh, she was a great dancer. She was a grass dancer. In this image there, you can look at her arms and see how thin they are. And you look at her breast and she's got, you know, she's, she died six months after I've taken this image. Uh, the lady on the left is her mother. Rose crow flies high and uh, she's gone now. But all these medicines that were passed on, you know, you, you think about them and people used to say, oh my gosh, you know, you should write those down, you should, you, should, uh, you know, catalog them and so forth. But, uh, you know, in certain ways they pass it on and now my sister on the uh, right has them. And uh, my other sisters, they share them. So that's, that's the power of it, I guess. Uh, some of the earlier works going across the uh, states and photographing, I would always run into these guys, a lot of tourists. Of course, it's, you know, they're open season. I would start to photograph them <laughs> and uh, take those images. Um, here, I, I always love this image. You know, you, as you travel, you come across all these uh, Europeans coming across the country. You get a lot of Germans coming here. And uh, here was Zig coming across, and I had my VW bus, and I parked it. And of course, they were all sitting outside and watching me. And I get out, and I take my Hasselblad out, and I get out on my VW, and they chuckle and they laugh, and they say, "Oh my gosh, you know, here's a, a Native American uh, Indian guy, and he's uh, driving a VW bus, and he has a Hasselblad." <laughs> so I always tell people, you know, being poor. Um, you know, getting myself through photo school, I, I couldn't afford good cameras, and I, all, I, I put my way through photo school dating women with good cameras. <laughs> I can go down through each series and, and tell you who I was dating at that time. And uh, the Indian photographing tourist season, I was dating Joan, who had a Mamiya 645. You know, this one was Jody, and that was the Hasselblad. <laughs> <coughs> That was a really nice camera. <laughs> Here's a recent image I took, uh, I think it's 2004. It's an image I took in, um, in um, where's it at? Anybody? Grand no? Teton? Where? Teton? Grand Tetons, yeah. Uh, Indian photographing tours, photographing sacred sites. And here they are photographing, and they're lined up, and they're so happy, and they're just like, just ecstatic, you know, and you got this beautiful scenery, and they're taking pictures, and I'm taking pictures of them. And I showed this to Patrick Nagatani, and he said, you know what, he says, that reminds me a lot of Manzanar, you know, and I said, wow, that, that, that you know, Manzanar being a, an internment camp for Japanese you know, during World War II, so. Uh, where's this one at? Crazy yeah, Crazy Horse. And uh, getting up there and photographing it. Um, um, you can see in the background Crazy Horse there with the arm protruding out. 
And uh, when I was there, there was a bulldozer. So this was, this was probably back in the early 90s. And I imagine they've done a lot more since then. Indian photographing tours, photographing sacred sites. And of course, this is of Old Faithful. Old Faithful is always faithful. So a very, a very beautiful image uh, of uh, people photographing sacred sites. Uh, getting on and just traveling cross country, here we have uh, two Mormon elders looking at a, a shop owner on the side um, selling rugs and, and uh, it was a kind of a nice image. We have the motifs of uh, uh, the Native Americans and so forth. And he's selling his ware. Uh, this one was up in Bismarck. It was a stand, and he's selling the sacred buffalo skulls along with the trinkets of the dream catcher. You know how popular the dream catcher, many of you have them hanging from the mirrors and, and so forth. It was really actually a real tool that the, um, um, you know, the, the Chippewa Ashinaabe Indians up here in, in uh, Canada area actually had. And they did capture bad dreams and, and good dreams. And they've gotten so popularized. It's actually the title of it is, uh, is uh, Dream Catchers and Buffalo Skulls. And the guy in the back is hiding. And, and I said, I'm just going to take a photograph of your stand. So, uh, which came into the first series. And this is a series I, I, I uh, worked with when I was first starting out. It's called Indian Photographing Tourists Photographing Indian. Uh, I went around and I would run into tourists. Uh, did you do that in spite, Zig? No, it wasn't a spiteful thing. It was just something that I was working with and, and shooting and, um, and, and photographing. Uh, Crow Agency, Montana, you know, being up there and taking that image. Uh, Taos, New Mexico. Yeah. Indian photographing tours, photographing Indian. Uh, I was telling my classes, um, you know, I use this image just because we have a camera doesn't give you the right to shove it in anybody's face. And I talk a lot about the, you know, the uh, National Geographic magazine and when they first went into these cultures uh, in the 60s and the 50s, they would uh, just go ahead and exploit them, camera rape them and then go ahead and put their images out. Now you've got to study these cultures. I don't care where you go. You can go down here to Cape Girardeau and study a culture there. They're totally different than up here and know what you're photographing. Uh, I also tell my classes, you know, you've got to have respect for people. Uh, that, ca that camera is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, some of you are going to go ahead and go through your nude phase. Know what you're doing through when you do that. Some of you are never get out of your nude phase. You know, and, and um, it, it's, a, it's a very sacred thing. Take care of your negatives. Don't leave them laying around and always know what you're doing with them. And why? Because they come from what you're thinking and so forth. So I use that series on that. Uh, just uh, humor stuff uh, in uh, corn dogs, hot dogs, and cold drinks. Uh, these guys are really, you know, after a hard dance, they're thirsty, and of course they're going to eat hot dogs and, 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 and drink. Soft drinks. Uh, this was a photograph I took up way up there in uh, Haver, Montana. I got on, that, um, I got on the um, Lewis and Clark thing. And I've been up here several times. I started out in uh, St. Louis and did the uh, Missouri River all the way up. And I made it as far as Haver up there uh, in the Yellowstone. And uh, there was a powwow going on. And this guy had a stand. And he would put the stand up. And it was take, you know, taking uh, studio portraits. And he, uh, you know, the tribal people would come by and have their photograph taken and so forth. And, and I stood there and took photographs of him taking photographs of people. And he was a much older gentleman. He was maybe in his late 60s. And he, he, he saw me taking a few pictures. Finally, I took one, and he came storming at me. And he must have been about this tall. And he said, who the hell are you? 
And I said, oh, my name is Zig, I, I teach photography. He says, bullshit, don't, you know, and, he, and it, this is what they do in the Midwest, they're gonna fight you. <laughs> you know, and he says, I'm gonna knock you on your ass, you know, and I say, hey, come on now, be cool. Uh, you know, I'm just taking pictures. And he wanted to fight. And I said, I'm gonna knock you down, you come any closer. He said, what the hell are you doing taking photographs of my stand? I says, it's a beautiful stand, I love it. I mean, the studio portraits. He says, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a professor at a college in Savannah. And I gave him one of my cards and he looked at my card and he goes, oh, okay. He goes, what do you think of Diane Arbus? <laughs> yeah. So next thing you know, we spend about a good half hour talking about Diane Arbus's photographs and, and, and we turned, in, turned out to be a really good guy. But it always puts you in that perspective, you know, you're out there, you know, you know, you I remember, you know, my father doing the same thing, you know, even if he was old, he was gonna fight, you know, and this is what they do, and ranching and farming and stuff like that, you know, they'll go ahead and put the dukes up. Uh, a stand, I don't know why you photographed this zig, but it was just, it was just, everybody was lined up for fry bread. No other stands had the power of it. I don't know if you've ever tried <laughs> fire bread, but it was a it was a good little stand. And uh, of course, it's really hard on you. I think last year I ate one fry bread. You got to watch the cholesterol. The cholesterol, <laughs> it'll kill you on that. So. <clears throat> Uh, this was taken at Reno Sparks, and, it, and again, it, de it deals with the matrilineal of uh, the, the woman, you know, who's going to bring us through but women. And um, these are Reno Sparks, Reno Sparks colony. Um, these are Shoshones. And what's going on with the, the, you know, the casinos and stuff, and, uh, you know, I think that they're going to bring us through when the hard times come. A stand on the side of the road. I tell everybody I'm built like this guy over here. <laughs> you know, and they always have that big fantasy about Native Americans. It's everywhere I travel, especially when I was out in California, you know, that I was always, you know, drawn, uh, New Agers were always drawn to me. It was like, what's, what's, what's your Indian name? What's your name? And I'll go with Zig, Zig Jackson. And, He'll probably go, my name is Wolf Child. <laughs> you know, or you will meet somebody that has a name like that. They feel we have a, a, a well, we, we do, a tie into the spiritual, but all it is is common sense. You know, you take something, you'll give something back. You kill a deer, you're gonna, you know, take a little bit of that and to walk over the hill and say thank you. Uh, you chop a tree down, you're going to take its branch and thank you, you know, I'm going to use this to heat my, my, my family. Uh, we're made into caricatures, you know. I tell everybody I, this is how I make out, <laughs> right there. And uh, we do have our names, you know, of course, we do have Indian names and so forth, and we do have spirit animals, and we, do, we consider them very sacred, and we're considered cute with the little dolls. Uh, being in the Southwest, I would always go on I-40. Uh, if you have ever traveled from Albuquerque out west, you'd always see these billboard signs. And I started photographing them in the early 90s, and, the, and I go back every year. It seemed like sometimes I'll go back with a Hoga camera and color film. Other times I'll go back, you know, with a, you know, with a Hasselblad. And so I started photographing all these signs. I finally had a big old show this past year with them at the University of New Mexico. Uh, here's a road, uh, uh, PP encampment alongside I-40. And you can hear all the tourists coming by and the kids going, oh, mom, come on, stop, mom. I want to stay in one of the teepees. Or you'll see the fry bread sign up in, well, this is actually a Monument Valley, this one. And uh, all the uh, westerns that John Wayne did were here, and so forth. Uh, this is in uh, Cherokee, North Carolina. Uh, the Cherokee, um, um, Eastern Cherokee. And uh, people coming out, and uh, 
you know, wanting to see Native Americans, you get a lot of them. Here's one of the signs on I-40 going west. And you'll get signs like this. So I would go and each year and go out and photograph them. Uh, some of you people that know tribal homes, you know that the home on your right has many beat up cars and, and about 20 dogs of all kinds. So uh, another sign, a roadside sign, bring your camera and the tourists are going from here, you know, east and going to California and begging the family to stop. Uh, the, you know, they never had teepees down south. You know, well, no one knows that. You know, the tourist comes by and says, oh my God, stop, please, let's buy some jewelry. You guys, anybody see these? Anybody? Um, the largest reservation. You can hear a child going, oh my gosh, dad, come on, I wanna see that large reservation. Well, some of them have to adjust. Uh, tourists come by. They say, "Hey, man, we, re you know, you, you know, we, re we, you know, you could use plastic money here." And then they put teepees on top of the cliffs, and they got a few buffalo, and uh, they're in the cave. So they are called cave buffalo. So uh, this is way up in South Dakota, and uh, you know how much, how much more can you confuse us? Yeah, now, uh, what, how do I feel today, uh, buffalo or bison, <laughs> you know? And, and, and as you travel, you see, a, you know, four or five carloads of Indians sitting there puzzled and <laughs> scratching their heads. When you go down south in the southwest, you'll see a lot of tribal people, and you're coming over the hill, and they're all sitting there waiting for you to cross, uh, especially out in Arizona where there's a lot of Diné, a lot of Navajo, and uh, usually when they do that, a coyote cross the road. And if somebody doesn't, you know, don't have any corn pollen, they're not gonna cross. They don't want no bad luck that year. So they'll pull alongside and wait for the tourists to come by. As soon as the tourist crosses, then they all get in their cars and they leave. They say, okay, good, we can go. <laughs> so that's, that's basically what was happening here. Uh, also, signs, uh, this is a, a little sign telling you of a, a little girl's band of Sioux Assiniboines that also got wiped out by smallpox, every one of them. So I would photograph them and read them later. So as that final show at the University of New Mexico, these were all up. I went up into Sitting Bull's grave. I was always fascinated with Sitting Bull, traveled all the way up there to you know, photograph him. You know, what kind of man was he? And he was, he's, he's buried way out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so is Sakakawea. You know, she's out there in the middle of nowhere. And in the background, you can barely see the uh, Missouri River. You know, the power of it in, in every way. Uh, going and, and, and being raised uh, with all these tribal people, I love to go up into these areas and photograph. And I, I pride myself as, you know, as I travel that I could, you know, walk down a street and if I see a tribal person across the street, I used to say, well, he looks, he's short and he looks like he's from the Southwest or if he's tall, you know, I could probably pick him out and say he's from the Midwest or Montana, how tall he is and so forth. These are Sioux Assiniboines, and this is up in Fort Peck. Very tough area. These Indians live up there. It gets, what, 60, 70 below zero. And they, they survive, and they live. And it's very beautiful in the summertime. Just a gorgeous time. Um, <laughs> these are northern Cheyennes. And these are up in where Two Moons was from. Uh, the road was unpaved. This is uh, an early 90s photograph. Uh, the road, the Corps of Engineers made a mistake. And on this side, the Crow Indians live, and on this side, the Cheyennes live. And the Crows don't get along with Cheyennes. Cheyennes don't get along with Crows. They don't like each other. Crows had scouts for uh, Custer, and Cheyennes fought along the Sioux against Custer. So the Army Corps of Engineers messed up, and uh, the Crows refused to pave the road, and the Cheyennes said, I'm not going to pave that road. You, you guys messed up. Let the Crows pave it. I think it's paved now. I, I haven't been back, but I, I, I hear it's paved. So, 
Uh, these are the Ute Mountain Utes, uh, Four Corners area uh, getting in there. They're a tough, tough uh, tribe to know, and uh, you, I go back, I, I, in fact, I spent a night there uh, this summer and uh, going in and, and uh, taking photographs. They have a nice casino there. Um, I don't know if you remember back in the early 70s, but a book was written about them called When the Buffaloes Free the Mountains. And it talked about uh, their, their hardships they had. So, and one of the few tribes that really benefit from the, uh, the, the, the usage of the casino. They have a very nice casino. And it's right there in that oil district where all those oil truckers stop and, and so forth. Uh, Crow Indians are very beautiful Indians. They're tall and handsome. And, um, you know, I go up there every summer. And when I'm passing through, and I try to come through the middle of August when they're having their crow fair. It's called the teepee capital of the world, and they have something like, you know, over 3,000 teepees and horses and people riding and parades, and it's very beautiful. So you, you want to get to know them, Zig, and you want to travel through there. Laguna, um, the, they're, they're, they're um, Pueblo people. I rented a house out in the desert here when I was going to school at the University of New Mexico. And they're very kind to you. Uh, their, their giveaways, you know, you could go and take part in their feast and they, they want that to happen. And they will feed you. You can go into the house and, on feast days and, and uh, they're, good, they're good culture. So, let's see, did I miss one? Yeah, uh, coming into um, San Francisco when I was first went out there to study, I did a series called Indian Man in San Francisco. I uh, would walk around uh, the sh San Francisco with this war bonnet on, and uh, I was it, it really dealt with the um, the uh, relocation program that the government had. Um, uh, in the 50s and the 60s. Well, they still have it. Uh, you know, they would take Indians off the reservation and put them in these urban areas. You, you go into Chicago, you're going to find a lot of urban Indians. You go into Denver, you're going to find a lot of them. You go into Seattle. It was a divide and conquer technique that the government had. You, you know, let's take them off the reservation, let's get them in there, teach them a trade, and they will forget about their culture. Um, coming into the Bay Area, uh, they, they used to say it was the largest concentration of Native Americans. So here was Zig looking for them. So, okay, come on, find the Indian. <laughs> <coughs> this is uh, down in the Mission, and these are the Laternos, the, the gangs they have, and they own this block. So I'm standing there, and I got my camera on a tripod, and I'm waiting for someone good to come along, you know, someone that looks very, you know, honest and respectable. And this gal came on by, and I said, can you take my photograph? And she said, sure. And uh, she was a student at San Francisco State. And I said, just shoot. Now, if they knock me down and start kicking me, shoot. <laughs> shoot. Just keep shooting. She said, okay. So, and I would wait for people to come by. Um, at that time, there was a movie out. It was a year of the Native American, and uh, in San Francisco, you ought, you had to have roommates. You couldn't you couldn't survive on your own. I mean, you you know, if you rented a flat, you had to have several roommates pay the help you out with the rent. And um, every time I you know I tell people, I wish I had a buck for every time someone said, "Hey, have you seen Dances with Wolves?" I would have you know. Made a lot of money. I actually said that to a guy recently in uh, in Savannah, and he said, "Hey, have you seen?" And I said, "I wish I had a buck for every time someone said that." So he digs in his wallet and he said, "Here's my buck." You know, so I had a buck, but um, <laughs> but um, you know, at that time, you know, there was movies coming out left and right. You know, there was what Pocahontas was coming out, and it was big. Uh, Geronimo, um, what? Squanto, you remember Squanto? I remember my uh, Legends of the Fall. You know, I always had women come up to me and say, oh, Zig, you gotta see Legends of the Fall. You remind me so much of that Indian guy. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, what other movies were out? Uh, Pocahontas, did I say that? 
all my roommates came back and said, oh my God, Zig, another movie came out. And I said, what is it? And they said, Indian in a cupboard. <laughs> so, you know, you had to take a bus and you'd always hear that. You know, hey, have you seen Indian in a cupboard? And then I think at the same year, I think the Indians were playing the Braves for the World Series. Indian man on the bus. <coughs> Indian man on the beach. And it could be any, you know, it could be any urban Indian and, and the hardships that they go through. And a lot of you guys, you know, even coming from different areas, coming into an urban area, it's hard uh, to adjust. I mean, sometimes, you know, you do get into that depressed time and, and get lonely and stuff. So. Uh, then I started my series called Entering Zig's Indian Reservation. So I made my own sign up. And I, made, I said, do I always have to photograph Native Americans? Why can't I be my own Native American? Why can't I be my own medicine man? Why can't I be my own tribal council? I can make my own rules up, open range cattle on the highway, no picture taken, no hunting. You know, new agers prohibited. <laughs> no new agers on my uh, reservation. <laughs> so I would come up into uh, areas that were very political. Uh, this was the uh, land that all the street people lived in. You get people living in boxes, big cardboard boxes, and and these 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 were like homes, and they were done very beautifully and reinforced with one buys and so forth. And I put the sign up and. It was the day the cops were out there to get them out to build the um, Bell Park. And uh, they came and they saw me and the guy goes, hey, it's a cool sign, man. I really like that, but you got to move it. And you have 15 minutes to, or you're going to jail. So I take it and move to City Hall. <laughs> so I occupy City Hall. You can see I'm renovating my building there. <laughs> I got to go ahead and do something with all the street people who lie on my lawn. So, and again, you know, I'd, I'd stand there with my camera up and people come by and we'll go ahead and push it and uh, the shutter in. And the same thing happened. And then sometimes uh, a week later I would go out and I occupied uh, uh, the headlands and I got the Golden Gate on my, my reservation. And I have to do something about the tourists, so I'm really contemplating what to charge them and so forth. In the background, you, you see uh, San Francisco. So. Uh, Golden Gate Park. I got William Randolph Hearst's buffalo on my reservation. So I do have buffalo on my reservation. So. And I still, I still have that. Uh, this is out in uh, getting more political with it now. Uh, not as much as I used to, but if I do see it, I still take the sign with me. Oh, Zig, did you know you could digitally do that? No. But it's much, it's much more powerful when you put the sign up and get feedback from people. Uh, here it is in Georgia, and that's paper, and that's the Savannah River, and, uh, and how much they're doing to the... Uh, Savannah River. This is up in uh, Tooele, Utah, and this is, this is the uh, Kennecott Copper Mines. And it's amazing. It's running 24 hours, and it's like, you know, these truck tires are about the size of this, you know, ceiling here, and they're, they're you know, you always count 15 trucks at all times. So, getting more uh, environmental with my work. Uh, I, I thought I'd put in some tribal people. Here we have uh, Joyce's actually younger sister, uh, Roseanne Crow Flies High, and just showing that little dichotomy of what, she's, what she has on. And uh, there. Uh, gosh, this, she, I took this photograph up in um, uh, Fort Kip, and she's Chippewa Cree. Her name is Sky Fox. Um, this is, uh, gosh, her name is Foolish Bear. Uh, she's, her dad died. I think I did put his photograph in on this next one. But she's doing a memorial for him and uh, a year later, and she's giving that horse away. Her name is Gertrude Foolish Bear. 
So here she is all dressed up and she's gonna donate that horse to probably one of his, her dad's best friends. So this was her father, this is, oh no, excuse me. This is a Indian boy with roller skates. He's roller skating in between the teepees. So I do also take the traditional ones uh, and having respect, uh, of course, even sometimes getting humbled, uh, being yelled at, having to go ahead and, hey, you know, put that damn camera up, there's no photographs taken. I think uh, being a, a photographer, many of you, uh, you know, you cross that line sometimes and you think about it and uh, it, it makes you grow and, and you know where you stand as far as your work is, goes. And, and uh, these are a fox society. It was an old society that died out in the 1800s and uh, they revised it. So the younger, the younger generation. This is Matt Foolish Bear and Jerome Dancing Bull. Uh, some of the names that uh, people have on that. This is not working there. Antonio, there you go. Uh, this is a guy I took up in um, um, a flea market. You know, I remember when I was quite young and uh, we were ready to go off to school, uh, my dad said, we're going to go see the sacred skulls. And uh, the sacred skulls were these, these, you know, two, three hundred year old medicine bundle that uh, there were sacred skulls. There was three of them. And the horns were probably about that big and they looked very petrified. And um, they... We went out to this old Indian place, you know, it was way out in the, it was way out in the prairie. And this old Indian man came out and it was a couple log cabins. And my dad got out and talked to him. And then before that, uh, just about then, you know, these cars started coming around and, and people were bringing food and they had a little ceremony for us, my brothers and I, we were going off to uh, boarding school. My dad said, my boys are going to school and we want them to learn new things and, and grow. And they had these huge buffalo skulls and, and uh, the guy did the ceremony and, um, you know. Before that was back in the 30s, the, the owner of the, uh, the guy, the caretaker, the native guy, he, he, he sold the, the sacred skull bundle to the, uh, the Hay Foundation in New York. And that's when the droughts came. And my mom used to say, when we got rid of the uh, skulls, the drought came. And now we got the skulls back. So, you know, and being brought up and knowing the power of the uh, buffalo and knowing the, um, you know, my Indian name is Gitapakitahish, meaning buffalo getting up, buffalo getting up in the grass. And uh, I was shorted to rising buffalo. So I come across on this flea market and I see this bison head. And I take my camera out and photograph it. And you see the metaphor of the, um, the, the fence. And you see this notorious statue that someone made. Uh, I, I even did research on it. The guy uh, lives out in Oakland of, the, of the, uh, the, um, the broken down Indian. And you see the metaphor of the fence. And you see this buffalo skull. And then I take the photograph and the guy's yelling at me and saying, that'll be five bucks for that photograph, buddy. But uh, I get up and I touch the buffalo and then I, I, I mat its hair down and then I walk away. So. Um, I prayed up at uh, Crow Fair and how much the buffalo is revered and he's up there in the front, the family buffalo. Uh, bring out the nice goods. They put the cradle board up. They put the headdress up front, and they got the dresses that are beaded and passed down, the beaded pants and the beaded, you know, um, bags and so forth. So, uh, coming across in uh, Cherokee, North Carolina, you know, you got the Cherokees, and uh, you know, they're a culture that. Um, that survives, you know, you come in there, you live in the great, right before you go into the Great Smoky Mountain National, it's a very beautiful, pristine area. It's like, it's unbelievably just gorgeous out there. And you got this tribe of Indians and 
These are the Indians that stayed. They were Solly's group when they removed them, when Jackson, Andrew Jackson, um, removed them on the Trail of Tears and took the band of Cherokees out to Tahlequah. This certain group of Solly's hid up into the mountains, and that's who these people are. But people come from the, uh, west, uh, the northeast and, and uh, you know, wanting to see Native Americans, they come on down to the Cherokee reservations, and you got these guys standing out. And this is a take a picture of the Indian and take a picture with the Indian. <coughs> so <clears throat> I spent a day there with him and uh, this certain person came in and uh, she had her kids and she says, oh my God, it's an Indian chief. Oh God. And then her little kids were there. And, Look, it's the Indian chief. Would you like to take a picture with him? Sit on his lap. This one little kid was so scared, he cowered behind his mom's leg. And here was Zig, and I had to put my head down, and I had this big old lump in my throat, and I didn't want to hear it. And she says, come on, you can sit on the chief's lap. Sit on the Indian chief's lap, I'll take your picture. And that little kid wouldn't do it, and the other kid jumped on, and so forth, you know. And I stayed there a good part of the day, and all the Indian guy, he never said a thing. You know, and they would take their pictures, and give him money, and so when I left, uh, he said, uh, you pay me, and I paid him $20, and he says, uh, I've been doing this all my life, this is how I pay my rent, and uh, I, I, I um, you know, went on and, and traveled and thought about that. Uh, down the road, uh, I, I just took this recently, actually, in 2004, the other one was probably in the uh, 90s, late 90s, but th it still goes on. So when people come, take a picture with the chief. Uh, the sign behind him is my camera, your camera, or Chief Red Hawk's camera. And people don't understand that, you know. They don't know what Native Americans are. Cherokees never wore headdresses. They never wore breastplates. But tourists don't know that. You know, they just want to come on out and, and buy. So... Uh, it's, it's, I guess it's survival, so. Uh, I got a grant not too long ago uh, from the John Marion Foundation for Photographic Studies in Santa Fe, and uh, a book was put out on photographers, writers in the American scene, and I, I did a, a, a documentation of American veterans, and here are some Uh The, the, um, the, um, the um, Native American culture is a culture that uh, is probably the only culture that honors their veterans with song. Songs are given to veterans that come home, and veterans start to dance this off, and they're very proud. We got a guy from uh, Vietnam. Uh, you know, this guy up here is a Korean conflict, and so forth. Uh, these are crows. This guy just got back from Desert Storm, and they're honoring him. And that's Yellowtail in the middle. And he's, he's uh, standing by. And the other guy's on leave. And people come on up and honor them. Uh, these are Utes. Uh, these are in northern Utes. Uh, I went out there to uh, see some of their ceremonies in there. Going ahead and honoring the veteran. Uh, these are Crees, Chippewa Cree. And again, you have... You know, the, the older gentleman's probably in WW2 and so forth. Uh, the guy at the end, there's a storm. And uh, they start everything off. I used to, I remember being young and, and I used to envy him. And I used to ask my dad, you know, you know, maybe one of these days I'll have a song. Maybe one of these days, you know, I could, I could be honored that way. And... Uh, Here's a flag song, you know. It, uh, they're just honored and, and, and revered and, and um, with respect. And the war mothers who have lost lives, uh, say, for example, a brother or a father or, you know, even a husband that uh, passed away in service, when they honor uh, uh, these veterans, they come out and dance alongside of them. So you could, you could see that work in that book. I think that's it. That's it. So.
<clears throat> I think I'm open for questions. I'll answer anything. I'll talk about anything. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just wondering, most of your pictures were black and white. I'm wondering if you just did they were working, yeah. uh, aesthetic purposes or just the choices. Uh, I photograph a little bit of everything, uh, anything I can take on a highway. Uh, I do a lot of color also. I, I don't know why I didn't bring any, but, but uh, black and white. I believe a lot in black and white, maybe. Um, and the archival process, maybe. So, anything else? Yeah? Did you bring the sign with you? Huh? Did you bring the sign with you? Did I bring? No, I didn't bring my sign with me. <laughs> but I do carry it with me when I do travel and I put it up. So, and um, it, it's, I, I look for posts a lot and I like it beat up. So, but I do take it with me. Did the landscape see a lot of difference in the reaction to your taking photographs based on where you are? Base at where I'm at, you mean down in Savannah, Georgia? Yeah, like any of the places you take photographs, do you notice that there's a difference in people's reactions to them? You know, you think a lot about people not wanting their photograph taken, but you don't see that. Oh my God, you know, you can't take pictures of them. You know, but it, it's really a, a stereotype. People love their photograph taken. I don't care where it's at. The Utes were tough. Uh, you go into the Lakotas, the, the Sioux, you're not gonna take much images. You know, they, I think they get a lot smarter as years go by, but once you get to know them, like I go back every year to these areas and then go, oh, it's a guy who takes pictures, you know, and then you can go ahead. You go down into uh, Nicaragua, you're going to get those little guys going, mm -hmm. you take my picture and, you know, you give me something. But uh, you don't see that as much up in, in these areas, though. So. Where was the boarding school? It was in Chamberlain, Chamberlain, South Dakota. It was called St. Joe's Indian School, and the motto was Home of Poor Little Indian Boys and Girls. And to this day, I get letters from them. I don't know if it was just out of luck, but uh, they send me letters, and if I send them money, they'll send me a, bead, a, a, a rosary. And I remember we put them together over there, and we would package them up, and if we did a number of them, we got candy bars. So if you did like maybe what maybe fifty, you got a you got a you got a candy bar, and you packed them up. What's their motto now? I don't know what it is, and I'm sure they changed it. But I went through there a few years back, and it's nice and beautiful, and they have a swimming pool. And they used to beat you. They used to delouse us. So I remember being a little eight-year-old, and they stripped us naked and. They had what they call these bug juice, you know, and they'd take these brushes and they'd paint this bug juice on us. And I used to cry and I used to say, oh my God, I hope I don't get, li I don't have lice. And my older brother would say, shut up. What's wrong with lice? You know, it comes from the earth, you know, and, you know, we didn't have lice. The Sioux had lice. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I think that's another thing I get from the Midwest. We, we poke fun at each, ourselves, too, and we laugh at it, so. But uh, I don't know if they do that. Yeah? I didn't see uh, uh, Saguaros. Do you uh, work in Arizona at all, or? In, in, in Arizona? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been through Arizona a lot. Uh, so I actually went down and spoke at the Center of Creative Photography in Tucson and did a lot down there with the, um, uh, uh, I want to say Tola Odom's Indians down in that area. So, didn't print any out. So. Same as you have time for maybe two more questions. Were you ever tempted to tell the uh, tourists to be stoic and then. Oh, that would be good, yeah. <laughs> Please be stoic. And those were the, the stereotypes that Edward S. Curtis put on us, you know, uh, be stoic, don't say anything. and, and Actually, there's some great images of him with ha having Indians that are smiling. Uh, he actually did a lot, you know, even regardless of how bad we looked at Edward S. Curtis's photographs. Um, you know, I was teaching at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and there was this Hopi kid, and his, he was so proud of the photograph that Edward S. Curtis took of his great-grandfather. And I said, aren't you mad because of what he did to the, na the Native Americans? And, you know... 
He said, no, he says, this is the only place we could come back and look at my great grandfather. It's a very handsome image. So, hmm. one more question. Anything? Uh, thanks for having me come up. I really enjoyed it, and, and I like coming up this way, so thank you so much.